Welcome to Spring into ETF Investing, a special edition of ETF Market Insights. On today's special episode, we will take a look at true liquidity and ETFs. Welcome to the channel and our Spring into ETF series. For those who are new to the channel, our goal here is to provide timely market-related insights and ETF-focused education to Canadian do-it-yourself investors with the goal to become your trusted partner in investing. We want to bring you access to the same level of high-quality resources that advisors and institutions receive in our industry. Before we begin, a quick reminder, we are not providing investment advice or recommendations. Today is all about education and information. Today, I'll be turning the stage over to Matt Montemuro, Managing Director and Head Portfolio Manager at BMO ETFs for our Equity and Fixed Income ETFs, and Valerie Grimba, Director and ETF Market Maker at RBC Capital Markets. In this session, you'll learn how to measure liquidity of an ETF. Valerie and Matt work very closely together to support the liquidity and trading of BMO ETFs, and they're going to discuss some common misconceptions when it comes to the topic, walking through how an ETF trades and what investors need to know when trading ETFs. Matt and Val, over to you. Val, thanks for joining us today. Uh, to start, we want to talk about ETFs and how they trade. We know they trade on the exchange, like a stock, but there's many differences between an ETF and, a, and trading a stock. Can you walk us through some of those differences from a liquidity perspective? Yeah, and this is kind of the key benefit of an ETF. You can both create and redeem an ETF. And so that kind of gives it this open-ended structure that we can really tap into as a market maker. So if you think about a stock, a stock has a finite amount of shares outstanding. So when a stock comes to market, it goes through the IPO process. This is considered the primary market. And then when you go and look up a bid and offer, that's the secondary. And the amount of shares is fixed. And the market cap will grow based on the price of the stock and how many shares are outstanding. But with an ETF, we as market makers can go in there and create more ETFs or redeem them, kind of destroy them. And this gives us a lot more liquidity to play with as market makers because we can be out there and kind of bid and offer and kind of take in this inventory and then create more ETFs. Now, the ETF market has really grown in the number of products out there, which means there are a lot of ETF securities that don't have a lot of daily liquidity. If you go and look up a ticker, it might have kind of low trading volume. I think that's a good spot to kind of ask you, what does volume really mean in the tradability or liquidity of an ETF and what should investors be thinking about? Yeah, that's a great question. And when you look at ETFs, I think it's important to understand the layers of liquidity that we see. And volume is just one aspect of, of an ETF's liquidity. So volume, that ADV, the, the actual shares that are traded between buyers and sellers on the market, that's actually a very small component of the actual liquidity of the underlying ETF. So if you think about the three layers of liquidity, we have the buyers and sellers on the exchange, and then you have the second layer, as you mentioned, the market makers, who can then have their inventory, they'll be uh, providing real-time quotes, and they'll be interacting with those buyers and sellers. And once that layer is, is exhausted, it then goes to the primary market where shares are then created or redeemed with the ETF issuer, myself. That's where the true liquidity of an ETF is. So if you look at it, that's where when we say at a minimum, an ETF will trade as liquid as the underlying market. That means the market maker is coming to the ETF issuer and we are going out and buying shares of, let's say, the S&P 500. If an ETF trades five shares a day, but has exposure to the S&P 500, that doesn't mean an investor can only sh uh, invest five shares. What they can actually get is that flow through liquidity from the underlying stocks. So that may be 500 million, depending on the liquidity of the underlying. So that's where when we're looking at volume, volume is uh, on the exchange or ADV is additive to ETF liquidity, but is actually a small fraction of what is available in the underlying market. So when you are looking at liquidity of an ETF, it is important to look at all three levels. And at the end of the day, it's the underlying asset class and the underlying stocks that really show the liquidity of an ETF. So at the end of the day, volume is not the be all end all when you're looking and choosing an ETF. Val, can you walk us through the bid ask spread and how investors should look at bid ask spreads in, in the ETF context? Yeah, and that's a great question because bid ask spreads also aren't the be all end all, but they're just another component kind of in the recipe book that we have as market makers out there. And it's something just to be considerate of. 
And, you know, market makers, we have a lot of technology going in the back end, a lot of models. Every night, you as the ETF provider give us a long list of uh, securities or holdings in every ETF. And this kind of all gets processed in our technology and pricing engines that come up with what we think is the fair value of the securities in each ETF and where we would buy those securities and where we would sell those securities. And so that's where we will post on the bid side and the offer side. Now, the bid-ask spread is going to be reflective of some of those volume considerations we just walked through. So if it is a S&P 500 ETF, we would expect that bid-ask spread to be very narrow because, again, we can tap into hundreds of millions of dollars of liquidity. But if the ETF is holding a little bit more difficult to trade securities, say emerging markets or complex options, those don't trade as tightly. They might even trade over the counter or in the upstairs market. And so we have to consider those prices and that will get baked into what the bid ask spread is. And so it's just, again, another consideration. It just gives the investor a little bit of knowledge and understanding. Um, but again, it's a very competitive process, the market making process. So I don't think anyone should be concerned there that someone is somehow taking advantage. It's just kind of where the average bid ask spread of all the underlying holdings in the ETF works out to be. So Matt, I think that's a perfect pause uh, and to send it over to you to talk about who actually are the main providers of liquidity when trading an ETF. Absolutely. So again, we, we spoke about those three layers of liquidity and, and there's, there's different actors in each of those layers. So on the exchange, those are buyers and sellers. That's retail investors, advisors, institutions, you know, everyone who's coming in and making their own investment views, they're showing up on the exchange and they are, are basically crossing the spread and executing based on some of those prices. The next layer is where the market makers come in. So every ETF in Canada will have a designated broker, a DB, that will be uh, make real-time markets for that ETF. But in Canada, we have a very robust market making community. So it's not just one market maker that we're relying on. In many uh, ETFs, especially in the uh, issuers like BMO, we have the entire market making community making markets across our entire suite. What that does is it ensures that the entire ETF ecosystem is well quoted, that market makers are supported with the data that they need, and that uh, the, as an investor, you can feel confident in the bid ask spreads that you're seeing on the exchange. So it is their job in real time to make those markets, uh, as, as Valid said, you know, with you know, those bid ask spreads as narrow as they can see in, in the market. From there, the final level is myself on the ETF issuer, ETF manufacturer side. We work very, very closely with our market making community. We want to be partners in, in, in each of our ETFs as they trade. So making sure that they have the data that they need in terms of the holdings. You know, at the end of the day, our job is to make sure the fund tracks the index to the best of our ability. But as a consequence, what we need to have is an ecosystem that is fully functioning and that allows investors to get in and out of our products in the most efficient way possible. So those three layers, those are the three parties that interact on a daily basis as we see flows come in and out of our ETFs. And so just to follow up there, with the, as the expert in the room, can you walk us through kind of that market, making, uh, market maker's role in the subscription redemption process? You know, how do you make those markets in real time every day? Yeah, exactly. Again, it just really comes down to really robust technology. And in some ways, we're very much in a golden age of, of market making. The technology is so sophisticated out there. Uh, at RBC, we have the largest fixed income bond trading desk. So on the trading floor, we directly plug in to this fixed income trading desk, which is the biggest, and then therefore they get kind of the best prices, and we can feed those prices right into what we think is a fair value for the bonds that an ETF could hold. And this kind of goes across asset classes. We're well connected with our commodities desk. We are very, very ahead of, I think, the competition and using options pricing. And again, if you're thinking about a covered call ETF, there are several uh, options that are in a single ETF, and we can plug into directly what our derivatives traders are doing and pricing on that underlying, and again, feed that through to uh, kind of facilitate really tight spreads or as tight as possible spreads on the market making side. Uh, and then it's probably a great time to just throw it back to you and ask the same question, but from the ETF provider. So from my seat, 
our job is to really help facilitate and be partners with market makers and provide investors with that, that ecosystem that makes it very simple, efficient, um, cost effective to get in and out of our products. One of the things that we do, you know, in, in Canada, we have 1,500 different ETFs. If you can imagine how difficult Val's job is making markets on 1,500 uh, ETFs in real time every day. So as an ETF issuer, what we want to do is we want to help and be additive to that process. So we're, we're running our real-time pricing on our product suite as well and making sure that we're a check and balance for the ETF market makers. If there's an issue, if there's extra volatility in the market, we can come together and say, hey, are you seeing this? Our model shows this. And as an ETF issuer, I can say my model shows this. And we can work together to make sure that you know there's no gaps in the market. There's not uh, all of our ETFs will have real-time spreads throughout the day whenever someone wants to trade. So as an ETF issuer, it's kind of that oversight as well, making sure that the ecosystem is running as smoothly as possible and that whenever an investor wants to get in or out of our products, they can do so efficiently and cost effectively. It, it is like a very collaborative a process. The same thing, we want people trading more ETFs and we want that process to run smoothly. So I think everyone kind of is on the same page here uh, and working together to make it a good, good place to invest. So we discussed earlier, you know, challenging markets. You know, it's it's very, I think, simple to say, oh, let's look at the S and P 500. You know, you can see the shares traded on the exchange. Let's extrapolate what the liquidity of an ETF would be. Well, in more challenging markets, let's say fixed income, merging markets, um, looking at areas where you know the underlying may be closed. You know, trading in Japanese stocks on an ETF, that entire market is closed throughout the day. You know, ETFs provide access to challenging markets in a very cost-effective way. And if you look at the bond market specifically, that's something that I, I really feel ETFs have democratized um, fixed income investing for the retail investor. You know, traditionally and, and still in the current market, you know, bonds trade OTC. Uh, it is a very opaque market. It is price discovery is very challenging. So for a retail investor to go out and buy bonds is extremely difficult and extremely uh, cost ineffective. So what ETFs have done has allowed institutional management and institutional trading to flow through to the retail investors. So my team on a daily basis is going out there and trading 1,700 different Canadian bonds that are in the market. We are getting, uh, we're trading with the entire street in Canada, US, globally, and we're passing those cost advantages through to the retail investor, allowing the retail investor to invest like an institution. And I think that's really opened up uh, investors' toolkits and really made it uh, much, we, we say it's the democratization of fixed income, but has really opened up uh, the ability of retail investors to look at fixed income in a more granular, precise way. And that's one of the big value adds that ETFs have had in more challenging markets. Val, can you walk us through uh, another market that, that may have provided uh, you know, challenges in the past, but ETFs have kind of created a solution? Yeah, again, I kind of look to those more difficult to reach places. Uh, and again, what kind of comes front of mind is ETFs that hold a bunch of different options or uh, different kind of option strategies. So we talk about even more complex things like straddles or boxes. And these are typically the uh, domain of institutions. And now all of a sudden, a investor can get this in a single ticker solution that trades throughout market hours, second by second, right? And so how do we, as market makers, facilitate that to be able to happen? We've gone through all of the kind of layers and how we work together on that. But again, it, it's kind of using, sometimes also ETS can, can be used as a price discovery, as a proxy itself. So again, to kind of steer towards when you're mentioning Japan, and Japan is closed when Canadian markets are open. And so we will kind of use a bunch of different tools in our toolkit to come up with what we think is going to, what is like a fair price and kind of calculate what is the kind of risk that we're taking on because we can't get out of the underlying position in real time because Japan is closed. And then that kind of all feeds through to what a trader or investor will see when they go in and type in that ticker. Uh, and so all this to say is I think, again, it's a really sophisticated technology that goes through on the back end, but hopefully providing a really uh, democratized, as you said, access to investing in a sophisticated way and around the world. And that's probably a great time. We can just finish up here on what would you say your best tips are uh, for trading an ETF? 
So several things to consider when you are trading an ETF from the actual execution perspective. I think first and foremost, always use a limit order. Uh, you know, markets are volatile, markets move around. You know, as an investor, you want to protect yourself. Limit orders will protect you from any sort of uh, adverse market move. And I think that is the, if I was going to give one best practice, it is always use a limit order on execution. Uh, the second one would be, you know, when you're looking to execute, tr maybe try to avoid the first 15 minutes and the last 15 minutes of the day. As you can imagine, an ETF pulls in underlying uh, securities data to have the market makers make real-time markets. When the market opens at 9.30, obviously not everything is traded instantly. So there can be a little bit of a lag effect and some data integrity issues in those first 15 minutes. And at the end of the day, we have different conventions like market on close that can distort markets. So if you want to avoid some excess volatility, potential for having you know, adverse fills from where your limit would be, I would always suggest you know, waiting for the market to, to open up a little bit for after the first 15 minutes, and then you know, avoiding that last 15 minutes, avoiding some of that, uh, that volatility that is really kind of market structure driven. It's not really you know, investment related. The final uh, best practice I would say is understand the underlying that you're trading in. So if you're buying, if you're looking, you come into Val and you want to buy um, European equities at 3.30 p.m. Understand that Europe has been closed for four hours. So there is no way for the market makers to actually hedge by buying the underlying securities in Europe until the next day. So what, that ha what happens in that case is that the market makers have more risk, therefore they have a wider spread. So often understand that underlying and if if you are executing in international markets, if you can execute while the market is open, you're generally going to get a better investor experience by narrower bid-ask spreads and better execution. All right, so in summary, always use a limit order. Try to avoid the market open and market close. And thirdly, understand the underlying securities of the ETF and try to trade in an efficient manner knowing that. Awesome conversation. Thanks for joining us today, Val. That was, uh, that was great. Mm -hmm.